Bonsoir tout le monde. Thank you so much for joining us. Uh, I'm joining you here from the um, Algonquin Anishinaabeg territory, unceded territory, and that's also known as Ottawa. And I'm here with my colleague Ruby. Bonsoir tout le monde. <laughs> So uh, we're very excited to talk to you tonight about um, the project that we've been working on over the last year, um, specifically how we're working with high school FSL teachers to kind of disrupt uh, the curriculum. And what we mean by that is we started working with looking at books that teachers were using in their classrooms. Um, so before we begin, I just want to say, uh, oh, I should also say we have a couple more members on our team who aren't here tonight. So Mandy, uh, and Amanda, and also our research assistant, Anza. Um, and um, if we go to the next slide, yeah, we want to give special thanks to our sponsors who've uh, helped us make this, uh, um, this work possible. So um, OMLTA, ACP, and CASALT, we're very uh, honored to be able to work with these great organizations that support FSL teachers across the country. Um, we also received some funding from Shirk and the University of Ottawa, um, which has helped us along. And this is our fabulous team. They're not here, so we thought we would put some pictures so you can kind of put a name to a face um, if you ever see them. Hopefully, fingers crossed, soon at some conference, uh, live conference. And also Anza, who uh, helped us put all this together and helps us, helps keep us on track. So our presentation goals for today are really to uh, inform you about this project and the resources that are available. Um, we'll be showing you our website where everything is there. And just to reiterate, this is a knowledge mobilization project. So it means that we're trying to mobilize all the wonderful knowledge that teachers have so that they can share it and then um, you know, take it up in their own classrooms and in their own way. Um, we're going to share with you some information about how this project supports culturally responsive and relevant pedagogy, and um, specifically, you know, orienting um, pedagogical approaches towards equity and diversity in the FSL classroom. And we'll talk a little bit also about why inclusion and representation is really important in FSL programs um, and how teachers can take that up in their classrooms. And lastly, we'd also like to be able to create community with all of you. So I'm so happy to see so many people here. Um, how many participants are we at now? 32, that's really wonderful. We hope that you'll get in touch with us afterwards. We'll show you how and get involved in this project because this is an active ongoing learning experience. Um, so we really wanna continue to create community together and kind of promote this idea of teachers as active learners um, that are perpetually evolving to improve their practice and adapting to the needs of their students, um, such as providing equitable uh, and inclusive French language education. Uh, I also wanted to add that um, myself, um, Amanda and Mandy are all um, FSL educators at the secondary level. Um, so a lot of what we share when we speak to our experience is in the secondary context. Um, and we're hoping that uh, we can make some partnerships with uh, uh, folks in the elementary panel uh, because we, we feel that there's a, there isn't enough uh, cross panel work, um, particularly around um, how to how to support students um, and and create a community of FSL teachers um, between panels. So if there's any folks who'd like to connect with us from the elementary uh, panel as well, we would welcome an opportunity to collaborate. So um, I'm going to talk to you a little bit about the origins of the project. Um, Initially, you know, um, the teachers, so Amanda started this, kind of started this, um, this project, and it was really important, I think, for, for her to think of ways to create um, cross-board cross collaboration. Uh, as I understand it, it's not a common opportunity for FSL teachers to get to work with teachers outside of their board unless they meet at some conference. Um, so this was really a way for um, teachers to kind of get together and develop a common vision, a shared vision for the delivery of the FSL curriculum. 
um, particularly with the needs that we have to address in line with the ministry policy actually about um, inclusive and equitable teaching. Um, so, you know, as Amanda has told us, like there was lots of, lots of stuff happening behind the scenes in the boards, encouraging teachers to teach more equitably, um, but it wasn't necessarily, there wasn't necessarily the hands-on um, opportunities for them to try things and start doing things directly. So uh, Amanda's a real go-getter. She decided to just go ahead and create this book club. And it started as a book club and uh, really get, get her hands dirty, I guess, with, uh, I guess, really diving right in into um, investigating or working on what it means to become a culturally responsive teacher. And especially also because there was kind of a lack of MPD that was relevant. I'm sure as many of you know, that is tailored for and to uh, FSL teachers. So this was also a way for teachers to be kind of leading their own uh, PD based on their needs um, to learn how to uh, uh, integrate anti-racist pedagogy in their classes. So we got a little timeline of the project. Um, back in spring 2020, the Peel District School Board released a report uh, that revealed that there was, I don't know if rampant is too strong a word, but maybe it's okay, <laughs> uh, discrimination and racism across the board. And, you know, it was, a, 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 I, guess, I can't say a shock because I think many people knew that, people who were in the board, um, but it was officially on paper now and something really needed to be done. So um, this is Amanda's timeline, actually. She usually presents this slide, but you'll have to come on Thursday to hear her talk about it. But basically she did her own personal PD in the summer of 2020 to kind of get educated on anti-racism and systems of oppression and how they operate uh, within the classroom. Um, she received some board directed PD in September on anti-racism and CRRP. As I understand it, an anti-Black racism was the main focus of PD for the Peel District School Board last year, um, but um, it it maybe it was too I don't know general or too um, it wasn't tailored specifically enough to FSL context. So Amanda thought of doing a kind of book club, and she was brainstorming with Mandy, our other um, team member, about this. And together they started creating a database of books. So she started looking for books that were in French. Um, that could be used in the class. And she actually had a really hard time um, developing like a long enough or big enough list. Um, and so this is when it kind of evolved into thinking of, okay, so how can I bring other teachers into this? Because I think at the time, there were lots of book lists that were being shared on social media and websites with English language books. And so finding the French ones was, was really proving to be a challenge. And so this is when she reached out to me in December. Um, and asked if we, if I wanted to join in on the project. So I work with future FSL teachers. I train them in the BEd program. So I was totally game to to do this. And um, the book club happened over the winter break. Um, it was just a handful of people at the beginning. I think it was like ten people. And um, we off. You know, she said, "Okay, everybody's going to read a book, and then we're going to debrief on it at the Pafilta." Um, meetings. These are meetings that are organized at the Peel District School, School Board for FSL teachers in February. So we did, we had a debrief and that's where we met Ruby. She participated in the meeting um, and shortly after joined our team. Um, and and from brought, there, brought some wire DSB educators with me in FSL. So it was very nice to see what other boards were doing and it was great opportunity to collaborate cross board as Mimi said. Yeah, and then from there, we continued developing um, the project, and we'll show you a bit what that means in a, in a second. And it culminated with the Summer Institute that we organized in August, thanks to the funding from SHRC and the support from uh, the associations I mentioned. And we were able to do a second book club. So usually the book club is we have um, teachers read a book. Um, we tell them it starts like in December, for example, and then we give them you know, everybody has about two months to read the book and then we come and have a meeting and it's a, usually about a two hour meeting and we debrief. Everybody presents one slide on their book and shares their pedagogical uh, judgment and knowledge about the book. Um, 
and then we gather all that information together, put it on the website so that other teachers can access it and build on it. So the goal really to create this uh, was to create a database of books that FSL teachers could use that are books in French. So either translated into French or originally written in the French language. Um, books that feature Black, Indigenous, and or um, racialized people as the main characters um, and that are anti-racist in the sense that they're not perpetuating stereotypes or um, negative um, images of people uh, that are appropriate, an appropriate language level for secondary FSL programs. So that adds a little bit of a, of a challenge sometimes to the books, but it's really important FSL teachers and that are teachable. So they have content that is interesting to the students or perhaps in some cases content that isn't too highly sexual or violent or um, could be triggering in other ways to students. And so, oh, sorry, Ruby, were you gonna do this slide? Yeah, that's okay. Uh, yeah, I just wanted to say that, um, as you said, Mimi, um, this work was being done in English departments in secondary through um, uh, in, in collaboration with FSL Disrupt, which is an, a group of uh, American um, teachers. So it was more in their context. And so there was a, a lot of work being done in Wired DSB to support um, English, um, kind of the disrupting the English canon. And the idea that there are certain books that have to be taught for certain grades, um, pushing back against, um, you know, uh, the marginalized voices and experiences and uh, in, in what is traditionally canonical English literature. And so we thought, you know, as FSL teachers are watching a lot of um, PD uh, support, a lot of funding to purchase new books was being given to English departments. And we understand why everyone takes English from grade nine to 12. So there was a there was an impetus there to, to um, really, really um, reimagine what the English curriculum can look like. And so I really admire Amanda and Mandy's kind of um, initiative and leadership in that they said, well, this is a great opportunity for FSL teachers to talk about, um, you know, our, what the assumptions made in, in, in our curriculum as well, um, and how we're delivering it and what books are being taught. And so really, yes, we're curating a list of books, but what we're really doing is building a collective understanding of um, how power, privilege, and oppression operate in our um, in our curriculum and really unpacking that um, through these novels. So the novels are a vehicle for hopefully what are more um, in-depth conversations about what it means to, to learn and teach French. Um, and that everything we do and all the choices we make as educators can serve to reinforce and disrupt um, systems of oppression that we work within um, as educators. And so um, I, I like to think of the books list as being a, um, a, a tool for uh, deeper, deeper learning with our students. And so uh, a little bit about how the books were selected, Mimi. Oh, sorry. Yeah, so, um, you know, we wanted to give teachers a little bit of guidance and a little bit of structure with how to come at the books. And of course, like keeping in mind, like this is a co-construction of um, teacher professional learning. So we're always listening to and working with the teachers who are doing this project, but um, we wanted the criteria to be founded in anti-racism and anti-oppressive principles of education. So we tried to put together this little list um, that would help teachers kind of assess critically how appropriate the books were for their class. And so we have this list of five criteria. Um, the author of the novel is from the culture being depicted. So we found that there were some books that were written by white authors, for instance, about um, characters from different cultures. Uh, so we felt it was important um, to have that kind of authentic connection for the author to the culture they were talking about. Uh, novels that prime um, novels that have uh, black, indigenous, and other racialized groups as the primary characters, uh, rather than peripheral characters in the book, to kind of reposition these actors as um, active members of the francophone community because they're usually French books. Uh, novels that include the culture of the racialized character without essentializing it or relying on stereotypes. So nothing that would kind of gloss over or present the culture of the um, other, I guess, uh, in a very um, limiting perspective. 
um, and kind of add nuance and depth to the cultures that we want to expose our um, students to in FSL programs. Uh, novels that are contemporary, so relevant to students' lives in the 21st century, or reflective of modern issues of, uh, and audiences. So it doesn't mean the book has to be from today, but at least have like be a well-written book that it can be related to today. Um, and then authors uh, from Canada or La Francophonie Mondiale, if possible, to kind of privilege or promote um, the excellence of literature that we have uh, in this country and in La Francophonie Mondiale. So right now we're actually revising some of these um, criteria. We had um, Melanie Riley Case uh, was our speaker at the Summer Institute um, and she works with uh, promoting black excellence in um, schools uh, in the Peel District School Board. And she has told us that she has some tips on how we could revise these um, criteria. So you see like we're always kind of evolving our practice and if anyone has any comments, of course, we're always very open to suggestions of this of that sort. So you can see that um, we had quite a lot of um, initial interest. Uh, and when I had joined on, I was surprised to see so many uh, educators had kind of picked up um, on this on this kind of momentum that was growing and it was really growing through social media if you recall during this time period december 2020 we were mostly um a lot of teachers teaching from home teaching remotely um and so this was entirely almost entirely um supported through social media and it was teacher driven pd based on uh teacher uh, self-identifying you know, that this is PD that I want, um, as opposed to a more top-down approach to, to PD. Um, and so it was more of a grassroots movement. Um, and so at the first debrief already, um, there were more than 20 novels um, that teachers read, debriefed, made the recommendations on, and that we will show you in a few moments, um, the, that um, feedback is available on the website. So after our discussions in the book club round one, um, you know, we realized that it was really important for teachers to have a good sense of, or the tools they needed to determine what language level is appropriate for what program. Um, and that was really helpful when people debrief that they, because they have experience in the classroom, they could give their uh, professional judgment on how appropriate the books would be. But of course, every school is a bit different. And so each teacher kind of knows what is good for their students or not. So if everything that's recommended on our website, you should always go through yourself to try to determine whether it's ideal for your context. Um, we also realized from our discussions that as teachers, uh, many of us needed to just learn more about stuff around the world, right? About cultures around the world so that we could help contextualize the books for our students uh, when, we were, when we were teaching them. Um, and sometimes I think for many of us in our education growing up, like history class, I don't know, didn't really cover like colonialism in the way that we talk about it today. And it's really interesting because in some ways, sometimes our students are a bit more educated on these types of things than we are. So this is a good opportunity even to exchange with the students. And then lastly, like what, how to have difficult conversations. So conversations that could be sensitive or delicate for um, students that could be triggering for them. So how to remain mindful of that. So how to address trauma, um, you know, from a, or how to lead conversations from a trauma informed perspective. Um, this is also some more training that teachers need and support that they need. So I think we're trying to build that into uh, this group as well so that we can learn together. Um, so next, I'm going to show you a little bit about our website. Uh, this is the, it's called, it initially was called the Catalogue Collectif de Livres pour la Diversité. Um, can you click on the link, uh, Ruby? Does it work? And um, we've renamed the project FSL Disrupt this summer because we're not just focusing on the books, like I just mentioned now, we're kind of ex using the books as a platform to kind of extend and explore like what facets of our professional practice and professional identity do we need to develop to be able to teach um, from a culturally responsive perspective. 
So if you go on our landing page, um, you'll just have a little bit of information about the project um, and just information of how to get involved. You can email us, our email's at the bottom. And yeah, we can go to the novels page. Um, so here we have a list of all the novels that we've reviewed so far, organized by program, you can see. So from grade nine to grade 12. Um, and then if you wanna click on any of those, Ruby, we can show everybody. Oh yeah, there's a nifty table there that kind of summarizes everything. If you wanna look quickly at which books were recommended for your level and your classes. Um, and if you wanna click on any of the books, we can show people what kind of information we're gathering on the book. So for example, in this book, we have a little summary information about the, public, the publication, whether it's translated from French or originally written in French, different teachers have different ideas of uh, what to use, what kind of book to use, recommendations for the different grade levels and programs, and then notes from the actual teacher themselves who read it. So what they said during the debrief meeting, our wonderful research assistant like Anza takes notes um, and shares all that. In some cases, the teacher who read it puts their name. So you can see Liam O'Mara put his name there. So if you want, you can even contact that teacher and like talk to them about the book and ask them questions. So we really want to build networks between teachers. Um, then if you click on book club, you'll have information about the process that we've put together for doing the book club. So first of all, you can choose a book. Um, here we've linked to all the uh, books. Uh, if you go back up a little bit to step one. So we've li linked to the book, that book list that we've created and we're con continuously updating. Also, if you decide to participate in the project, we will reimburse you for the book that you're reading up to $30. So you can just download the form there and send it to us and we'll send you a, a reimbursement check. And then uh, with step two, um, we kind of lay the groundwork for um, critical, uh, if you can scroll down for me, Ruby, because I can't remember. Oh, step two is the reimbursement. Okay, step three is the um, developing a critical perspective. So here's the criteria that we just talked about. Uh, and we add in step four, like some critical reflexive questions that you can ask yourself about the book so that when you come to the debrief meeting, maybe you can address some of these points or maybe you'll get inspired by some of these questions to kind of contribute um, to your judgment. And then I think at the very end, we put when our next book is happening. Oh, no, sorry. Yes. So you fill out the debrief form, uh, usually before the next book club. And Amanda prepares, we, we ask everybody to prepare one slide. And then we put it all together at the meeting so you can pre present your slide. And then we have the debrief. We let you know where it's happening. Uh, next, we have the Summer Institute that we had this summer. So there's all the information about the Summer Institute. It was really the opportunity to come and talk about these topics in more depth and connect with other teachers. Uh, we had about 50 people attend uh, the Summer Institute. And if you scroll down, you'll see the whole program for the Summer Institute, who were our wonderful presenters. And in fact, I see Karen and Cecile, who were uh, our keynote speakers are here. Um, and so what kind of, uh, sessions we had. If you scroll down, you can see the description for the sessions and who our presenters were, their bibliography, their biographies. And if you keep scrolling down uh, on the side, Ruby, underneath, you'll see all the resources that came out of the um, Summer Institute. Um, so it'll be, under, it'll be under the program, Ruby. Nope. <laughs> if you go, put your arrow on the side, like put your cursor on the gray part. Yeah. And then you can go down. Like, I'm sorry, yes. what are you looking for? Oh, this. Yes. The, yes. The, the, okay. You're talking yes. about, yes. So you can actually view all the slide decks that were prepared. Um, that also includes um, all the teacher resources that were shared uh, during the Summer Institute. So if you scroll down after like let's say for example you're interested in knowing about 
um, tax selection, FSL course planning, and how can you plan, um, do some backwards planning to support novel studies so that the novel isn't just the only time that you address any of these issues, for example, um, and you're building intercultural awareness and understanding throughout the course. Um, if you're interested in, in looking at that, for example, um, you can scroll down and then um, that that slide deck and resources to support um, the the planning during the course um, throughout the course is uh, is available. Yeah, you book. can click on it if you want just to show. I don't think I can. Oh, you can. <laughs> Sorry. Oh, okay. Yeah. <laughs> well, you'll have to you'll have to go, people, and click on it. Yes. Um, okay. And then what else do we have? Then we have other information just about like the project. You know, our mission statement um the history of the project that kind of thing about us if you want to know more um i think those are the main things right for the website you can explore it um there's lots of stuff on there um there's just a sorry there's just a question in the chat from meredith um est-ce que les livres ont des recommandations pour immersion française ou français de base les deux Yes. Les deux programmes et intensifs aussi pour les euh, conseils scolaires qui offrent le programme intensif aussi. Oui, vous pouvez voir euh, programme français de base et, et l'année, comme neuvième année, dixième année, onzième année. Donc, on a fait les deux pour vous. Um, so, what kind of precipitated uh, the Summer Institute was that um, there were a lot of student needs and teacher needs that um, came to the surface or were surfaced during the first book club uh, that took place uh, back in January, February um, of 2021. And so uh, there were a lot of um, questions about um, sort of the lack of PD on how to incorporate diverse voices and experiences in FSL. Um, in terms of student needs, you know, intercultural understanding often just sits at the surface level of examining surface culture. And how do we build intercultural understanding and awareness as a competence that grows from grade you know, nine to 12? Um, we have you know, a clear progression, say, say, uh, based, right, for, um, you know, which is embedded in our curriculum about you know, how les compétences langagières are progressing from year to year. But what does intercultural competence um, and understanding look like from year to year. And it's very, very vague <laughs> in the curriculum document. And so um, it mentions an area of the Francophonie and not a whole lot much more, um, maybe accent, regionalism, but what about examining um, how knowledge is created um, from different world perspectives? And that's where kind of things get um, sometimes left at a surface level. We also want to make sure that just offering books that um, depict you know different worldviews different lived experiences is aren't isn't just a sprinkling of of uh, diversity kind of like putting you know um, a little bit of seasoning on top of your course and then that's done uh, we really wanted to empower teachers to do deep learning with their students um, around um, you know the idea questions about um, you know how texts are written, how um, colonizers are using the, the, the colonizer using the colonizer's language, right, to speak to their own experiences. Um, and we also had teachers identifying their own needs around how to bring these um, marginalized voices from, you know, to the center of the learning, but identifying their own learning gaps. Um, and, and gaps in the planning of the courses uh, in order to uh, incorporate this learning effectively so that we're, we're again scaffolding this learning. Um, and so this, the idea was to, to make those connections and to build some instructional strategies with teachers and some um, good pedagogy around how to um, like where to start with the novels. So um, it's not sufficient to just give a list of novels, but also the the instructional practice that goes towards supporting them um, in, in the teaching and the planning cycle with students. So 
the summer institute as mimi mentioned was a two-day institute with a variety of workshops there was opportunity for fsl specific professional development to learn engage and plan for tangible actionable changes uh, to the text we use in our fsl classrooms so um you know the the first stage is always to question and say you know whose voices are included um whose experiences are included in the learning and whose are not whose are missing who are marginalized um, and to dismantle assumptions about what texts should be included and to redefine often what texts are um, to kind of open, like we offer on our website, the idea that, you know, there's, there's a list of novels, um, but of all different genres, uh, which is, which is something that a lot of folks, they thought, oh, I never thought about, you know, incorporating mystery genre or uh, a bande dessinée or something uh, of that nature. And we're hoping to expand even further and look at graphic texts and, and, um, and other text forms as well. muting myself so as ruby mentioned um some of the goals here were to not just talk about the books themselves but how to teach the novels and we talked about different formats for teaching novels whether it's a book club or a whole class novel study um, we also wanted to share where to find resources how to create our own resources and think critically about resources so that they are responsive reflective and build intercultural awareness for the teachers and also for the students because I think teachers also need to learn and practice how to develop their own cultural awareness but then teach intercultural competence to the students and that's like another part of your training right uh, how to deepen our um, understanding of the text selection what does it mean when we make the choices so as Ruby said like every choice says something, whether you want it or not. And I think it's important for us to acknowledge that as FSL teachers, and then how to um, further our understanding of CERP, CRRP and those kinds of um, um, pedagogical movements that are really important now nowadays. So I think Ruby mentioned there was time to plan together. What I really liked about the Summer Institute is we had um, teacher led planning sessions. So we had all these, it wasn't just like us talking at people there. We had like specialists come in in the morning and then we had like teachers talking to teachers in the mid morning. And then at the, in the afternoon, the teachers just broke off into groups and did their own work together based on what they were inspired uh, about and what they want to learn more. We found also at the secondary level that um, we want to move away from a whole class novel, but we understand that not everyone has the same, you know, um, access, uh, budgetary access as well. So we kind of differentiated based on teacher response and teacher needs. So some teachers said to us, I have money, but I don't know what to buy for my department. Um, and so we, we I, I did a session about um, the book club model and how do you run a book club where instead of buying 30 copies of one novel, you buy maybe 10 copies of, you know, three novels or five novels um, to spread between two sections of a course. Um, and then Amanda did a great session about how do you work with the books you already have uh, in order to unpack them, question, um, you know, what assumptions are made in those texts, look at it from different critical lenses uh, in order to surface maybe some and problematize the representations that exist in, in those novels and start to question that um, when you have those budgetary constrictions that don't allow you necessarily to always purchase new books. Yeah, so at the event, we had um, 57 participants from 20 different school boards, mostly in Ontario, but we had people from other provinces as well. We, we did one book a uh, debrief book club debrief that was like the star event of the show of the summer institute and we gave like as we said time for teachers to collaborate with colleagues from different school boards um, learn with each other share best practices and even create resources that they could use in the class in september so if you go on our website as we showed you can access the slide decks for every presentation and just above that you'll see there's also a document we created called main takeaways so i'm not sure if you're able to click on any of those ruby 
Um, but basically this document puts together like the main ideas of each of the presentations. So because the slides can be a little, some of them are great, like they have all the information, but some are just like there to inspire the conversation for the speaker. So they need to be a bit more contextualized. So we wanted to have like the essential ideas for people to refer back to. So we've put links here, but you can basically just go on the website and access um, that document. Um, and so these are all the different presentations we had. Is this me? Oh, this is you, sorry. Yeah, so the last slide was the presentations and which again are accessible on our website. Um, just some takeaways just to, to highlight um, some of the ideas that were surfaced during the Summer Institute to, to share with you. Um, we talked about, you know, why are we reading literature at all in FSL courses? Um, is it just to give them a content test to see if they read the book? This is often something that teachers are having trouble letting go of. Um, you know, um, as we move towards sort of 21st century uh, learning, um, modern learning, uh, the idea of content versus um, certain competencies that we're trying to build is a mindset shift. It's difficult for some uh, folks to, to move the dial um, and talk about, you know, what, what are we doing in terms of co-building knowledge and co-constructing knowledge with teachers, uh, with our students. And so that requires teachers to kind of shift their own thinking about their role in the classroom from uh, the person who holds all the knowledge and passes it to the students to co-creating and that's also speaks to the power dynamics in in uh, classrooms and the power that we hold as teachers and how can we empower our students uh, to to learn with us uh, to co-create knowledge uh, in the classrooms how do we create thinking classrooms where questioning is more important than finding necessarily answers um, and applying knowledge of language um, in order to to deepen conversations and deeper learning uh, we also talked about, you know, moving towards discovery, hypothesis, discussion, content focused learning, um, context instead of content focused learning. And um, we also talked about, you know, the idea that we don't want to just bank knowledge in our students' heads. We want to give them the tools to um, come up with their own ideas and interpretations of the of the text that we teach in our classrooms. Um, we also surfaced, you know, deficiencies in the Ontario curriculum, I'm speaking in an Ontario context, um, around intercultural understanding. It doesn't address inequities. Uh, there is no anti-oppressive um, framework, anti-racist framework um, in, in the FSL curriculum. And so there are some, um, there are some, there, there is an opportunity to, to improve. Um, and we can't wait for the Ontario government to change the curriculum. We have to, um, you know, use the power that we have as classroom teachers to address um, what is missing in our in our curriculum. Um, we also wanted to talk about um, the fact that books, as as we um, as we speak about. Uh, you know, the literature that we choose, it, it can uh, reaffirm or it, it stereotypes or it can challenge. And so we have the power to make uh, choices that can uh, enrich our students' lives or make them feel marginalized in the in the FSL classroom. And that's, that's something we have to, that responsibility is something we have to engage with and we have to question um, as educators. And that came up in a lot of the conversations about assumptions that we make about what should be included um, or the idea that, you know, certain literary genres are more rigorous right, than others. Um, and so kind of repositioning and questioning those assumptions was uh, some of the conversations that were surfaced, was part of some of the conversations that were surfaced during the, uh, the Summer Institute. Um, I spoke about literature circles, the idea of giving students choice and voice about what they're going to read um, and starting with presenting options to students um, in terms of five or six possibly novels in a course and that um, we have to support the learning by uh, curating resources and facilitating the learning for each group of students that are reading a different novel. So you really take kind of a co-learning stance with students when you do book club. It isn't so much about, um, again, banking information for students um, and having them you know, give that back to us in, in, in our assessment, but really getting them to start to question and, and engage with the novel on a more personal way and making, um, making meaning um, together collaboratively in a book club. 
um, it's not just about knowing the plot, right? Real engagement with the book is, is goes deeper than that. Building thinking classrooms, we talked about that as well. Um, a shift of, of mindset, as I said, towards, um, you know, making thinking visible, for example, um, using things like sketch noting, mind mapping, um, you know, web quests, um, cercle d'apprentissage, where the students, you know, find resources or we curate them and they find meaning or they, they decide what is important um, that is applicable to their understanding of the novel. And so um, it, it requires uh, a little bit of giving up your, our power. And that's really if we want to engage in, in reframing um, the FSL curriculum and reframing our role as educators to empower students, we have to really question um, you know, and, and be, be more comfortable with um, giving some of that power to our students in the classroom to make choices, to make decisions, um, to question, and to think critically. Yeah, I, I love that. And, and, you know, I often get the question from teacher candidates like, how do I do accommodation in FSL classrooms? You know, am I supposed to teach like 10 different things to 10 different students? Like, this is a great example, inquiry-led learning, our inquiry-based pedagogy of how you can inherently accommodate in your practice because the student is going to be leading their own learning. So it's going to be at their level, in their area of interest. And as a teacher, you just kind of have to follow along and, and support them in that learning. Um, so I'm talking about here uh, the whole class novel study. This is what Amanda presented on. And here, so as Ruby mentioned, you know, in some cases, teachers don't have the budget to buy new books. So they have to work with Le Fantôme de l'Opéra or Le Petit Prince. Um, so then what can we do then? How can we teach these books in a culturally responsive way? So we might want to think about how to recontextualize the book um, try to link the book to what's happening in the world right now, uh, or maybe ask ourselves and have students ask, you know, whose voices are being represented, whose voices are not represented, are there any stereotypes, how are the voices being represented, and how are the um, um, participants or sorry protagonists being uh, represented. Also talking about like decentering or maybe nuancing and complexifying our understanding of culture, right? Culture isn't just like linked to one nation. Um, even within a nation, if we want to use that as a as a measure, but in, within any group, there's lots of different opinions, different experiences that exist in that culture. So it's just about developing that language of like, okay, just to, you know, I am using this generalization to talk about this culture, just know that this isn't the end all be all representation of culture. This is one way of representing this culture. And there are probably other people who have, who have had different experiences. So how teachers can learn to kind of hedge um, their language and present information in a way, because we do need generalization sometimes, but acknowledging and telling the students like, this is a generalization. Okay, so let's look at it in more complex ways. Um, like I said, linking things to today's topics, students today are very in tune with what's happening in the world. So I think being able to relate the content to their personal interests will be a great way to engage the students and make FSL class much more powerful and meaningful for them. Uh, they can tell right away when something is very surface level and has no sub substance. So we really need to like um, give students that kind of uh, agency and, and respect, I think. Um, and then applying different lenses to look at the perspectives that are being presented in the book. Um, and then our last presentation was by Karen and Cecile. So putting it all together, um, what's important for teachers to know or, you know, teacher educators or teachers to know, like, first of all, teachers have to think about their own positionality, their own identities. Uh, who are they? You know, what does it mean to be a settler colonial uh, working in you know, on this land in Canada, um, you know, how does our experience as from these positionalities influence the choices we make and the ways that we talk about um, other people's cultures or, um, um, you know, the, the, the way, the, the worldview that we share with our students. Um, same thing for students. So they need to understand 
their own positionality and who they are. And um, Karen and Cecile shared with us so three important tenets of the of culturally responsive uh, pedagogy. So focusing on academic success, having high expectations and high standards for our students, um, cultural competence, viewing students and the cultures they bring to the classroom as an asset rather than as a challenge uh, or as something to be ignored or silenced and also developing critical consciousness. So that kind of those critical questions that Ruby was mentioning earlier, asking questions and thinking about, well, what do I really mean here? Like, what's the underlying message? What's the implied message here? Um, and finally, acknowledging that like representation really matters. So um, non-racialized teachers really need to think about um, how to engage critically, how to do it um, from a place of respect and understanding that it's a journey, you know, learning this. This is a new perspective. Changing systems takes time. And so we do, but you have to do it. And I think as teachers, we all like to be perfectionists. We all like to do everything right the first time. We want to have our lesson plan done and it's Hi yeah, like perfect, but this is not going to happen this way. This is messy. This is we're going to have to try things and stumble through things and we have to honor uh, that process and I think be kind to each other as much as we can, but also take responsibility when um, we've done something wrong and we've hurt someone um, because who wants to do that, right? And I think the the way to kind of empower teachers is to put tangible um, completely like um resources that they can use right away <laughs> with their you know and apply right now with their students in their classrooms and so um we were able to share some resources around um what types of questions for example you can engage um in and and show as examples to students um when they're when they're looking at a text in order to delve deeper and ask these more um more in-depth questions and also uh, what roles different students can play in a book club or in a classroom discussion um, which allow them to uh, put almost put aside but it also kind of think from a different perspective than maybe what they're used to or that is informed by their positionality um, and so those resources are available on our website and they are um, reproducible uh, PDFs and, and other uh, documents that can be used by teachers uh, when they're doing a novel study. And so we invite you to go to our website and, and have a look at that. And it's all available um, for, for anyone to use with their students. And uh, lastly, at the end of the Summer Institute, we had participants give us feedback. Um, I think this is a really important part of doing this work is being accountable to our community and being transparent with our community. So we really wanted to hear from you guys how it went. Um, we got overwhelmingly positive feedback and any critical feedback that we got was also, I consider positive feedback. It was very helpful to like, you know, help us see where we can go and how we can improve. Um, and overwhelmingly, the teachers really appreciated this opportunity to um, be able to self-direct their learning and um, kind of customize the professional learning format. Um, and then we asked also teachers where they think the future direction should be. So there were quite a few teachers interested in doing this with the elementary panel. So if any of you, like Ruby said, are here, like we are open to developing kind of sister project to continue doing this work. Um, and also, it do, you know, applying these educational principles in other areas of their practice. So, you know, how does it work in math class and French immersion in science class and French immersion, those kinds of things. So please stay in touch. This is our contact information. You can email us at fsl.collective.catalog at gmail.com. We're also on Twitter and Instagram. Please give us a follow uh, at FSL Disrupt and you can tag us at hashtag FSL Disrupt. And we'd love to hear your recommendations for novels. If you have any uh, experiences with teaching that you think are important to share that you know we can take into consideration and build it into the professional learning that we're doing with the community um, or any kind of requests that you want for support. Um, yeah, we'd love to hear from you.